I'm Drew Stevenson. This is for my professional responsibility class. We're continuing our discussion of conflicts of interest under Model Rule 1.7. And here we need to talk about the duties that firms have and lawyers, if they're solo practitioners, to check for conflicts of interest before they undertake the representation. And what happens if a new conflict uh, arises that even though you checked? So let's dive in. So this is really fleshed out in comments two through um, four of model rule 1.7, how you're supposed to uh, check for conflicts. So here's the sort of steps. First, you have to clearly identify the client or clients. Uh, when you're in law school, it sounds like this would be easy to do, but in practice, this can get a little complicated, especially if you have a large corporation that owns lots of subsidiaries or you're representing a subsidiary that has um, a larger umbrella organization over it or lots of uh, uh, affiliates or something like that. So sometimes you're going to have to spend some time really identifying who the, is the client um, and then determine whether a conflict existing or potential conflict of interest exists. Then ask yourself the question of whether the representation could be undertaken despite the existence of this conflict. In other words, is it consentable under 1.7b? So remember, there were four factors. Are you going to be able to provide a diligent and competent representation to them? Is there any law that would prohibit the re representation in this special type of case? Um, you're not trying to represent one of the clients against another, hopefully, in the same litigation, uh, like being the plaintiff's lawyer and the defense lawyer, and everyone is willing to give informed consent confirmed in writing. And if so, you get all the client, the affected clients, informed consent and, and confirmed in writing and proceed. Now, it's very common that a conflict of interest is clear before you even agree to undertake the representation, in which case you have a duty to decline the representation. In other words, to turn away the case or the, the, uh, refuse to take the case. Again, unless the lawyer obtains an informed consent from each client under the conditions of paragraph B. And this sounds straightforward, and for test purposes, I think it should be uh, fairly easy for you. If you uh, discover during your conflicts check that you have a conflict, then you say, no, I, you'll have to find another lawyer. You refer them to another firm, uh, perhaps. But in practice, this can be difficult. What if your firm is struggling and you haven't signed up a new client in a long time? or you're, under, uh, you're a year or two out from making partner at the firm and you're under a lot of pressure from the partners to bring in your own clients to the firm. In either of those situations, it may be kind of painful for you or you may really struggle to just turn away a potentially lucrative uh, client or, or representation matter because of a conflict. And so a lot of lawyers will kind of rationalize in those situations and decide the conflict isn't so serious or um, it's too attenuated to matter. Um, to determine whether a conflict of interest exists, a lawyer should adopt reasonable procedures appropriate for the size and type of the firm in practice, whether it's a litigation firm or um, non-litigation, and whether or if you're a firm that does both, uh, how you're going to check for conflicts for each type of matter. And so this is very important. Um, it you could be sub the uh, firm could be subject to discipline for failing to have conflict of interest checking uh, protocols or procedures in place. Now, notice it says um, it depends on the size and type of the firm. So if you think about it, if you're a, a solo practitioner, um, you're the Lincoln lawyer, you practice out of the out of your car, you might be able to count your clients on your fingers and uh, you only have a handful of clients at any given time. So when someone asks you to represent them, it's very easy for you to do a complex check. You just think, well, no, I've never heard of the um, uh, other parties involved in this case. So, of course, I can represent you. I, the larger the firm, the more the potential conflicts uh, can grow exponentially because you have more lawyers and more um, clients. So if you have a, a national firm with uh, 2,000 lawyers, and they represent thousands and thousands of clients. Some of those are large corporations with lots of su subsidiaries and uh, joint ventures and things like that. Um, checking for conflicts can become uh, difficult. In fact, a large firm is likely to have very expensive special software for this, 
and even some dedicated lawyers whose whole job, whole full-time job is to check for conflicts for new clients for the firm, for the other lawyers that, um, uh, to represent. And typically there will be support staff that is dedicated to this and very uh, highly trained in checking for conflicts and screening for conflicts. And so uh, we don't have a bright line, like if you have this many lawyers in the firm, you have to have this in place. But uh, keep in mind that a, a lawyer or a firm could be subject to, to discipline for not having adequate conflicts screening procedures in place or checking procedures uh, for the size and nature of their firm. So let's go back to the comments here. Comment four says, if a conflict arises after the representation has been undertaken, the lawyer must ordinarily withdraw from the representation unless the lawyer has obtained informed consent from uh, of the client under the conditions of paragraph B. So um, this can be difficult, and it's a reason to really do your checking um, that sometimes a new conflict can arise. And we're going to talk about that more in a moment. Now, whether the lawyer may continue to represent any of the clients depends on um, can you comply with the duties of loyalty owed to the former client and of confidentiality, and can you adequately represent the remaining clients given the duties to the former client. So what happens when a brand new unforeseen conflict arises after the representation begins and catches you off guard? Well, comment five really fleshes this out for us. Unforeseeable developments such as changes in corporate and other organizational affiliations or the addition or realignment of parties in litigation might create conflicts in the midst of a representation that catch you off guard. In other words, even if you checked thoroughly for conflicts before, new ones could arise and then you have a problem. And they give an example, and this is kind of the classic example. Uh, let's say that you are suing a large uh, company <clears throat> on behalf of um, a, a new client, but then that opposing party, that co company is bought by one of your other clients, let's say a large uh, corporate client, um, that the lawyer represents in an unrelated matter. So let's say there's another XYZ corporation for whom you are doing some compliance, regulatory compliance work and getting permits and licenses and so forth. And then you represented uh, an individual plaintiff in a personal injury case against a company or uh, a business with whom you had no dealings, but then XYZ Corporation, for whom you do compliance work, buys that company. Now you have a problem. The lawyer now has a conflict of interest, and we this is a directly adverse type conflict because they are now opposing parties in the litigation. And this is true even if it's partial ownership. Depending on the circumstances, as we said previously, the lawyer may have the option to withdraw from one of the representations in order to resolve the conflict. But keep in mind that you could end up having to withdraw from all of them. Um, if the matter has already been filed in court, you will almost always have to file a motion to withdraw or basically seek court approval to withdraw if it's pending. Um, it, it, this is almost always granted unless it's like on the eve of trial or during trial and would be disruptive to the proceedings. We'll talk about this more later, but keep in mind that a judge does have discretion to force you to stay on a case, um, even though you want to withdraw or you think you have a conflict, a conflict of interest, or the even if the client fires you. But they don't usually do that. Um, normally, if you try to withdraw from a case, again, as long as it's not going to disrupt a trial or be on the eve of trial, um, the, the courts almost always approve that. Now, keep in mind that when you withdraw from representing a client, that person is now a former client. And so you still have a duty of, to protect their confidential information. You can't use it um, to the advan strategic advantage of the client that you continue representing. We're going to have a rule we talk about later on, 1.9, that's about former clients. And section C of that rule is about protecting the confidentiality of former clients. So once you withdraw from representing one client, your current conflict goes away, 
but now that person becomes a former client, which triggers the application of Rule 1.9. And that concludes our lecture about checking for conflicts and what happens when something happens in spite of your best efforts to check.